Welcome, my 204 subscribers, those of you who have not given up on AEW yet, and I'm just gonna say it now, to all of you fucking old heads, Jim Cornette fans, or just unfun people who hate the ending of the show, get out of here, go fuck yourselves. This is my review of AEW Dynamite in Toronto, Canada for the October 12th show. Let's begin. Okay, so I was supposed to release the Battle of the Belts 4 as well as the Impact Bound for Glory review first, but this show just had to happen and was a bit busy. So those are going to come right after this. I don't know about Battle of the Belts though. I might not go through with a review of that since it was like nothing special. First match was amazing, next one was okay, and then the last one wasn't that good. Yeah, there's the Battle of the Belts review right there. And as for Bound for Glory, I think we had like another match of the year candidate. But yeah, enough of that, let's get to this show. So we start off the show with native Toronto Canadian, Renee Paquette, aka Mrs. Moxley, FKA Renee Young, opening up the show, welcoming everyone from Toronto to the show, introducing herself and whatnot, as well as getting cheered the shit out of by the crowd. And this move makes absolutely fucking sense. I don't know why it took this long, because Renee Paquette has always been like a great interviewer, especially in talk shows and talking smack. She has that voice that's just so whole and very comfortable to listen to. So in long stretches, you don't get tired of her voice. She's also very fucking attractive. But of course, since this isn't a WWE return, people are gonna downplay this. People are gonna say it doesn't matter. They're gonna say she's nothing special, but come on, guys. Y'all fucking loved Renee back in the WWE. So please, cut the shit. What worries me here is the interview time or the screen time that it takes away from Lexi Nair and Alex Marvez. But more from Lexi Nair, who's actually showing or like starting to show personality in the show. As for Alex Marvez, honestly, not the best, but does very well in comedy segments. So yeah. If you like split the time between these three, or if you have like a talk show that you have aside from RJ City, who's like the best, this is gonna work out really well. But if she takes time away from your established interviewers, there's gonna be a problem here. But yeah, as for now, nice debut. And so her first thing is that she interviews Christian Cage, who faces up the crowd first, but then heals up the crowd they cheer for him anyway they cheer for the heel and the face in this match in like the match to come but this is toronto canada they all love christian cage i think they're all pretty into the maple leaves being mediocre i don't watch hockey but as a kings fan like my uh, team in the west is the sacramento kings i understand how it is to make fun of your team so yeah no foul here. This didn't completely turn the crowd against Christian. And as for the match itself, Jungle Boy versus Luchasaurus. And I love that they start the match swinging. It's a fight. They don't do wrist watches. They don't lock up. They don't wrestle. They fucking fight. Jungle Boy goes for a sneak attack first. Luchasaurus then overpowers him. And then we get to like the main story of the match. And it's Luchasaurus's right arm. And Jungle Boy's back. So yeah, they work on these, especially Luchasaurus's right arm, which plays into the ending. As well as like the post-match celebration. We get an awesome table spot, but this match is supposed to have DQ. And the way they explain this away is that Luchasaurus set it up. So if he gets put through it, it's okay. But that's kind of a stretch. That's too much discretion for the referee. This match actually didn't need a table spot. It could have been saved for the rematch, honestly. And yeah, the rules need to be enforced a lot tighter, a lot stricter. Because Jungle Boy just power bombs Luchasaurus through a table. It looked very good, but at least have it happen in the rematch because Luchasaurus ends up winning. It's a hard fight, but he ends up winning anyway, which I'm now sure that there's going to be a rematch. We get like a Luchasaurus Undertaker setup. That's alright, but you're already being 
accused of stealing so much shit already. And then we get this tease to like an avalanche spot. But Jungle Boy instead turns it into like a tree of woe position. But Luchasaurus counters. He uses his height to handstand and then spike Jungle Boy's head. We also have the working of the right arm pay off when he goes for a choke slam, but the right arm doesn't work like it used to, and instead he uses the left, which Jungle Boy kicks out of because it's just not the same. There's not as much power in your weaker arm to actually like do your finisher properly, even if it's a finisher. And then we get a lot of storyline moments when Jungle Boy goes for a kill switch, he then hits it on the second try, but we also get like one awesome storytelling moment where Luchasaurus has Jungle Boy on this like electric chair position like how they used to when they were still a team and then Jungle Boy just poison Rana's Luchasaurus this was really good might be number two spot of the match snare trap rope break and then we have the ending Christian distracts Jungle Boy Luchasaurus takes advantage of this he hits his reverse fireman carry slam and then wins the match with Christian trying to raise his other hand first but of course he's injured and Christian's also injured so it's a bit hard but since Luchasaurus is supposed to be like a dinosaur and like stronger and Christian is the heel on top of this he ends up raising Luchasaurus's right hand which is a bit of a dick move but uh scaling of strengths here so yeah now for the spots of the match number three is the Tree of Woe running attack counter by Luchasaurus. He spikes Jungle Boy's head, and this just like came out of nowhere and was really cool. Number two is the table spot. Yeah, it's really cool. It's an awesome looking spot, highest impact spot of the match, but that should be a DQ and should have been saved for the rematch. And as for the top one spot of the match, it's the electric chair poison rana spot just a call back to jurassic express it's an awesome storytelling moment and yeah fucking beautiful spot and also i'd like to mention the honorable mention which is luchasaurus trying to choke slam him with the right arm but then goes for the left because the right just hurts too much and yeah this match is like a tv main event pay-per-view undercard match it was really good it might be jungle boy and luchasaurus's best singles match yet and fitting it's against each other and also i forgot to say that the crowd was super hot fucking toronto awesome wrestling city this might just be recency bias or like because this is AEW's first show in canada but toronto fans have always been very vocal about sports teams and wrestling bret hart as well as the raptors the second most toxic fan base in the nba number one is the knicks of course and maybe the Lakers. Yeah, okay. Raptors are number three. But yeah, great match. Next segment. So after this is a backstage encounter between The Firm and Jose against Matt Hardy and Private Party. And this whole thing is weird. Involving The Firm buying two African-American wrestlers' contracts. Basically passing the problem off from a stronger higher up in the card faction to a middle of the card faction it's now possible for matt hardy to actually beat someone here and yeah i totally think ethan page shouldn't lose i think anyone in the firm can lose except morrissey and ethan page or like if you if you do it correctly ethan page can lose it can be acceptable but to have the match on rampage like the conditions for their match it's gonna be ethan page against isaiah cassidy on rampage and if cassidy wins they're free if page wins they take private party in the hardies and i think it would be a cool storyline if cassidy loses which is probably gonna happen and then all of them just make the firm's life a living hell as they're in the faction and then the firm just gets sick of them and kick them out or maybe have jeff hardy save them but yeah, that would be a really fun long-term storyline. But I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think it's going to play out that way. It might be a lot worse. Tony Khan's in a down period right now. But yeah, all right segment. Ethan Page, I'm glad he's talking more. He didn't need Dan Lambert. And even if with Stokely Hathaway, they find a way to have them both talk and then make the like 
the dynamic between the two really fun. So yeah, both complement each other well in their promo so far. So after this is War Joe with Wardlow and Samoa Joe against The Factory. This time it's Nick Camarado and QT Marshall. So that's a lot of big dudes in the ring. QT Marshall gets his ass kicked, but Nick Camarado does a little bit. He manages to look pretty strong against a team of like two monsters. This is almost a squash match, but the jobbers are named. They have a little bit of a chance, but ultimately, was the result really in doubt? So yeah. Samoa Joe holds on to Camarado's legs, Wardlow does a swanton bomb, and then Samoa Joe locks in the re-naked choke for the win. After the match, they powerbomb Symphony QT, but they get interrupted by the embassy. Prince Nana has a nice accent, but him and Brian Cage don't really say much here. It's just something to bring out FTR and to prolong this already lopsided feud. And then they announce a trios match against the Embassy, where they hint heavily at their teammate. They do the tens. We all know who it is. It's fucking Sean Spears, and he's back. And now Babyface, and will probably be the one to take the pins in this faction, unfortunately. It's a very cool return. Unexpected. I thought he was released or, like, not renewed. But you can't have the Embassy get swept. So why not bring this guy in to take the pins? It's a shit choice. I don't think you should like add a new person to a faction just to pin him. There's always the smaller tag team to get pinned by Brian Cage, but come on, man. Easy solution for that. Adding Sean Spears to the faction just makes the matches more predictable. So after this is an interview segment with Chris Jericho and 2.0. And it's very much like the last one, the one last week, and it's pretty much the same. Same position, same setup, Ange doesn't talk, but again, it's basically the same thing but worse. Last week's promo like this was better. And this just moves the chains for the match later. So after this is Swerve versus Billy Gunn. And for the rap that Max Caster does, it's certainly one of the worst that he's done. It's just so plain and boring. Nothing really much jumps out at you except the Trudeau line. But they're still over, so yeah. For the match itself, there was a lot of working of Billy Gunn's leg. And at one point, it started feeling like a Billy Gunn ruthless aggression match. Where he was used to put over a lot of talent. But here, he's allowed to do a lot of, like, ass things. He's allowed to shine more, the crowd is hotter, and he's allowed to wrestle a faster pace. And he actually kicks out of Swerve's finisher, which is the double foot stomp. And I didn't like this shit. If you have two guys who are, like, this far in portrayal and push, Swerve should have finished Billy Gunn with that double foot stomp. There was no reason to, like, protect him. There was no reason to do a dirty pin. Because in the end, this just makes Swerve look weak. But the match, though, was really fun. A spot of the match is this sequence, starting from a tilt to world slam, clothesline, and then jackhammer. So yeah, a really fun match. This is TV undercard, pay-per-view undercard. But I just don't like the ending. If you're pushing Swerve to be a main event player... He should be getting this win clean, even if he's a heel. So yeah, after the match, the acclaimed bust through Swerve. They like go through him. They don't even try to like avenge daddy ass, which is okay. The acclaimed are honorable and everybody loves the acclaimed. They go for a consolation scissor, but Mark fucking Sterling and the varsity athletes cut it short. And every week or like every time Mark Sterling shows up, this guy's the MVP. He starts this story with the acclaimed. It's just like a small side quest thing. Something before the next pay-per-view happens. Or whenever Keith Lee and Swerve are ready to, to like get back in the ring. Sterling brings out a document. And there's only a few things I hate more than bureaucracy. And he says that he's trademarked scissoring. So the acclaimed are not allowed to do the scissor gesture. They're not allowed to 
say scissor me daddy ass anymore. They praise America, which gets so much heat from the Canadians. And he threatens the acclaimed that he's going to sue their ass and they're going to be stuck in legal hell if they so much as allude to scissoring. So yeah, this is a harmless side quest. It's just a thing to get the varsity athletes their title shot. The match is probably going to be awesome as well. It's the ultimate heel story for Sterling to like take scissoring. The payoff is going to be awesome and the crowd's going to pop, of course. And who doesn't hate fucking bureaucracy? And this is a commentary on the legal system and shit, but yeah, <laughs> enough of that. This isn't an anime review or like a movie review, but it actually kind of is. It's a commentary on the legal system and shit, on how people take advantage of it, just like the dudes over at Stanford. So yeah, fun match, but even better post-match segment. And after this might be the best segment of the night. Of course, it's MJF. Uh... He gets interviewed by Alex Marvez. They talk about Wheeler Yuta, like the handshake. But then he's interrupted by Stokely Hathaway. He gets pissy and threatens to fire him. And I think this is happening too early. They're threatening to break up the faction this early. And I think the faction can work with Ethan Page, who's like an MJF type as well. But at least have matches with each other first. But the promo that comes after teases a face turn from MJF. There's a lot of depth here. And just the delivery is automatic. It's a perfect, well-acted delivery. He alludes to a supervillain past, and he teases a face turn when he says, when I go out there, I don't like me either. There's just so much behind that that I hope we expand on it in the future. Maybe let's get a spin-off movie, a prequel movie of MJF. But yeah, very effective promo. And it keeps MJF hot for the championship match at Full Gear. While the current world champion still has to deal with something else. But yeah, before I crown this, the top segment of the night, just because of the ratio of promo time to promo quality, as well as just the depth of the content and what it's trying to do, I'm going to have to watch the Mox page promo that comes after because I have a prediction and it's not a very hot take, but it might be for WWE fans or just fair weathered AEW fans who think this is just to make the WWE better. So yeah, next segment is Mox and Page. So the segment opens up with Moxley setting the table. He describes what it's like to be world champion. He describes pretty much how hard it is, how dirty it is, and he takes shot at Hangman Page because we all know that Hangman Page is like a millennial cowboy. He's anxious. He's not a go-getter. He's not like aggressive enough, I think. That's his old character. And Mox uses this to start some shit. Anxious, doubtful, second-guessing. That's like pretty much what Adam Page was before winning the title from Kenny as well as when he had the championship. And then right on cue, Adam Page makes an entrance. And then he cuts the best promo of his career. <laughs> he does the whole thing, the babyface thing, where he like praises the shit out of Moxley. He builds him up. He brings up the issue that he has with him. And then he does the thing where he makes the crowd feel sorry for him, says all of the misfortunes. And then he goes in a direction that I didn't think would be acceptable in this day and age. And it's to call himself a man. He delivers this part of the promo with so much passion. He yells all over the place. He even hits his head until he bleeds. And then he does all of this while saying that he's all here despite all of those problems because he's a man. And this is not as deep cutting as MJF's promo. I think heels have better opportunities to cut deeper cutting promos. This is like middle level depth, but he manages to maintain my interest. Uh, the crowd was too distracted by MJF in the crowd, and I think that was a pretty bad move if he wanted to put this match over. I think MJF should have been backstage, but I think they're setting up a triple threat match. That'll be interesting. But he cuts a very awesome promo here. True 100% babyface promo from a true babyface. I don't get 
why people say he's bad at promos, why he's uncharismatic. I mean, the dude can cut a promo, just watch this shit. But it just takes like more time for him to get there. It's not like instantaneous like MJF. Hangman needs to build it up some more. And as for now, I think he can only do babyface. But yeah, I'm gonna have to give this segment of the night. MJF's promo was just a little too short. It wasn't as important as this one, but it builds interest for the match next week at Cincinnati. So yeah, segment of the night, great promo by Adam Page, but I think he needs to maintain this. As well as when the time comes, when he feuds with MJF, I think this is like, this level of promo is enough to like stand toe to toe, but he needs to reach into like another level in order to make that feud great. So yeah, best segment of the night. Can't wait for next week. But also, I can't wait for that Hangman Page versus MJF feud 11 months from now before MJF's contract expires. So after this is Jericho versus Danielson 3. We've had this match in a span of a couple of weeks. And this isn't how you're supposed to do a feud. But it's in Toronto, so I guess it's okay. And also, I forgot to mention, Claudio had a promo where he's going to face whoever who wins this match. So I guess we know the next feud going in. So yeah, for the match, again, this is the third time that these two have met in the ring. And this has to be the second best among the three. This is a lot less technical, but also a lot less exciting. So it's in the middle. And they do go for some new stuff, like the Liger taunt, Danielson going for the walls, avalanche butterfly suplex, as well as an attitude adjustment, and maybe the best-looking two-legged codebreaker that Jericho has done ever since he left the WWE. And that might be spot of the match. But most of the match is pretty much the same. The crowd completely made this one. They even did a This Is Awesome chant, which I think wasn't deserved, but yeah. And for the finish, Danielson dodges a Judas effect. There was no slowdown in that spot, so I really liked it. But Jericho pushes Danielson to Paul Turner, taking him out. Magic and Ange then hand Jericho the title. Garcia looks like he's gonna save Danielson, his favorite wrestler apparently. But then we get another turn, and this just ruined all the goodwill, the little goodwill from the match that was left. I wonder how they'll explain this away, but as of now, this storyline is fucking ruined. The crowd love this whole thing, but no. It's a bizarro crowd. They'll cheer who they want to cheer, and they'll boo who they want to boo. It feels like this isn't or these aren't the right reactions, but yeah, I hate the booking decision. The match is a bit overrated. This is like a TV undercard, pay-per-view undercard match. And stop doing these already. If we get a fourth match, I might just stop reviewing these altogether. The fourth match will be a void in my reviews. I'm just, it's, it's, it's just going to be like skipped over. The hug at the end though, looks like there's some depth there. Garcia makes a face as if he's not sure. There could be something with this. He isn't smiling, he isn't celebrating. But yeah, it'll depend on what happens on the next few weeks. Because this is a bit weird, because uh, he's supposed to have a match against Lee Moriarty. I think they've already forgotten that. And it only works if Garcia is a babyface. So yeah, I don't, I don't like this booking decision. They should have just had Garcia... Cost Jericho the match. This storyline's dead. It lost all the heat. They have to do something completely out of the box and like mind-blowing in order to save this. So yeah, spots of the match, uh, number one, there's only one. And it's the codebreaker counter to the diving knee. So yeah, Blackpool Combat Club show up and then we have like this West Side Story, Romeo and Juliet sort of encounter and then they leave. So after this, on the complete opposite side of the spectrum, we have an interesting storyline, but it's a bit cringe. And yes, it's, it's like pretty cringe and pretty dumb. And I think Nyla Rose has gone insane, but it's pretty interesting. Nyla Rose has had a mental breakdown and has stolen the TBS title and now thinks she's a champion. And this is like really funny. 
but I'm seeing some tweets that don't understand it this way. And I don't know if it's the American education system. Education system here is also pretty dumb, but this just takes the cake. She is not treated like a TBS champion, and like Renee Young doesn't treat her as the TBS champion. She addresses this, and how do you interpret it that way? But yeah, Anna J starts some shit, and then the match is on on Rampage. And some further proof is that the match card doesn't have TBS championship match on it. So yeah, stop being dumb, learn how to read, and study more. Fucking dumb shits. So after this is the tag team match between the team called Shieldstorm, courtesy of Nyla Rose, versus Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter. So here we go again. Uh, these matches that feel like it's just... The, the same tag team match where they just rotate out the women every fucking week. But the positive of this is that these tag team matches turn out to be better than actual singles matches. Especially ones with Tony Storm in them because, yeah, I'm not a big fan. But yeah, for this match, again, it delivers. Uh, the story of the match is Sheeta wants Brit for revenge. <laughs> And Tony Storm is just a secondary character again. So they start the match, alright. It's fast paced, it's some fun stuff. While Britt does some awesome work on the corner. It's like it's like she's a manager who's in the match. I love the work she does. It's actually weird because we get a lot of camera shots of her. It's like she's the main character of the match, and we're seeing things from like her third person view and yeah i mean maybe dial back on this uh feature the other women more instead of like obsessing over brit baker but yeah brit avoids sheeta for most of the match uh tony's the one who's getting beaten all of the time for this one she's the whipping boy and let me remind you guys she's the fucking women's champion so why have her take the beating i mean why why do this shit <laughs> like if you want her to take the beating if you see sheeta as more valuable just make her the champion she should have won in the first place so this happens for like a long time but then their teammates finally get hot tagged in and then they fight and then after this part the first spot of the match candidate happens when Sheeta does like a superplex to Jamie, who's on the apron, while Britt is on the turnbuckle. Awesome spot. But this is beaten by another one much later. Scratch that. This next spot actually beats that one out because Sheeta defends herself 1v2, but she gets overwhelmed with super kicks, a lariat, and then what's next? A curb stomp, and then she's pinned for a near fall because Tony breaks it up. The crowd is a bit lost for now. They don't gain the crowd yet. But after a storm zero, followed by like a pin breakup where Tony gets pushed on the pin, the crowd finally react bigger than they did earlier. And then finally, I think it's a bit undeserved, but I can see why the crowd would chant this is awesome uh sheeta hits a disaster kick followed by a tornado ddt by tony storm to the outside like in a rapid succession this is awesome chant it's okay it was a cool spot it's like the top spot of the match but the match isn't as good as the tag match with serena deep that one's a lot better and then brit attempts a lockjaw there's a sort of struggle sheeta goes for this suplex power slam to a pin exchange and then Sheeta gets the one two three pin after like multiple pin counters and yeah this match was all right i think it was better than jericho versus danielson which is like saying a lot already and then the top three spots of the match are number three the avalanche suplex number two Sheeta 1v2ing both of the heels and number three is the disaster kick, followed by the tornado DDT to the outside. You know what? Uh, Tony Storm finally removed the Alabama Slam from her arsenal, but she just needs a little more.
She needs to be more than just a seller. She kind of feels like Finn Balor now. She finally does her moves all right, but it's just missing the kick. And she might be missing just one or two more big moves in that arsenal to be like considered to be a main event women's star. Ishida has it all. I love the finisher. And I also love the in-ring charisma and just the things she does in the ring. But out of the ring, especially in that vignette, not very good. She needs to work on that shit. Britt Baker is like a complete product. Inside the ring, outside the ring, wherever, charisma ball. And she can go against anyone and will make that match exciting. And then as for Jamie Hayter, fuck. She should be a babyface right now. I mean, they, they had the perfect opportunity to break this team up. And they didn't. The crowd is already starting to lose interest. Like, like the heat for Jamie Hayter is starting to go away. By all rights, she should be the women's champion or contending or just plain away from Britt Baker since she's kind of being outshone. But yeah, really good match. Nice effort from everyone in the match. Tony Storm wasn't bad here. And I'm going to give this a rating of TV undercard, pay-per-view undercard match. Where this story is going since we didn't see Soraya for some reason, I don't know. Storyline-wise, this is, this is a bit weird. But I guess it's resolved now because Sheeta got the pin. Her feud with Brit is over. <laughs> I mean, she got one up on her from being assaulted backstage. So yeah. And then before the main event, we get the cards for Rampage. They look okay, but not anything spectacular. And then as for the Butcher and the Blade promo, the badly placed promo before the main event, uh... The Butcher's voice got deeper for some reason, and they finally sound like like a ferocious, mean... What other words can I use? Gruff fucking tag team that sh- we should be taking seriously. They finally sound threatening enough to challenge the Blackpool Combat Club and maybe have like a small chance. But the highlight of the segment is the bunny, Ali. She does like a bite on the camera and... It was pretty hot. I don't know why this team still hasn't been pushed. I like the gimmick. Ali hasn't been used on Dynamite in like ever. And hopefully this thing on Rampage will be used to like elevate them in defeat. But BCC are gonna win obviously, but yeah. And so after this, we have the main event for the All-Atlantic Championship, Orange Cassidy versus Pac. And no question about it, this is the best match of the night. This is the most controversial match since Jim Cornette's least favorite wrestler is wrestling and won a championship. And people seem to forget that this is all a work and that comedy characters who are like shittier in the ring, like Santino Morella, who Jim Cornette also hates, people seem to be okay with him. And this is weird because, like, WWE fans who like Jim Cornette, like the crossover that happens there, whenever Jim says anything bad about AEW, the, the, like, the fans double down on this. They, like, agree 100%. But when Jim says something bad about the WWE, they make excuses, and then they, like, treat Jim. They don't actually listen to him. They treat him like this fucking senile old man that he probably fucking is. If he says anything bad about the WWE, his fucking fans will say, Oh, I'm sad you have this opinion, but uh, he's really, really good. Or they're just gonna comment that this person is like better than he thinks he is and Jim should give him a chance. Fucking double standards. Fuck, I'm, I'm, I'm like becoming Wardlow now who complained about the internet, but... Some people say Pac is treated badly for some reason. Like, how? The man defended two titles in a single week. He's like a double champion. I think their first one. And he had a pretty lengthy reign with the All-Atlantic Championship. And not to mention he was the first All-Atlantic Champion. He beat like three strongly booked dudes. Two strongly booked dudes and one mid-carder. And yes, I fucking guarantee it. 
that if Orange Cassidy somehow goes to the WWE, fans would be sucking his dick, jerking him off 100% of the time. And then even if he does the same shit or worse, people would just call him better there. So yeah, please cut the shit and stop being fucking dumb. So yeah, as for the match itself, <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, had to go on that tirade because I fucking hate social media, man. But yeah, as for the match itself, uh, the match starts with Pac mocking Orange Cassidy. And this was actually like really fucking funny and fun. The crowd reacts hard for the whole match. And I think this is what sets the tone. This is what sets the baseline crowd level. And then they follow it up directly with a spot of the match, which is like Orange Cassidy manages to drop kick pack right when he does the super kick part of Orange's shtick. And so, yeah, Orange manages to drop kick pack. This sends pack outside. Orange goes for an outside dive, but pack catches him, delivers a falcon arrow, and then we get the first spot of the match candidate. And I was pretty surprised because Pax matches usually end up being him doing a rest hold, setting up for the brutalizer. He just like stays there, like does some steps. It gets really slow with Pax sometimes. And I don't know why. He, he is capable of better things, but then he just like does a lot of rest holds, especially in the like match against... In the first match against Orange Cassidy and that trios one. And yeah, so, but here we get another spot of the match candidate after Pac soaks in the reaction from the crowd. He pulls Orange, like Orange's carcass, Orange doesn't move, to the stage and then he tombstones him on the ramp. The ref starts a count out count. But then Orange, like, rolls to the ring. What a great fucking spot that suits Orange Cassidy's character. And I love that in this match, uh, unlike other pack matches before, there is not one wasted motion. Like, for the whole time, there's something important happening. There's no rest holds. There no, there's no, like, useless shit that's going on. Like, it's either something really entertaining or it's Pac going for the hammer. He's like doing some storytelling here. As well as Bryce Remsburg. Because after three matches, I think Remsburg was the ref in every one. And I'm glad that they're including him in the storyline. He's now being smartened up. He's finally learned after the third fucking match that Pac has been going for the hammer. It's like, dude, just watch like the replay of Rampage or like of Battle of the Belts and then you'll know because this has been happening a lot and it took the third fucking attempt for Remsburg to finally get it but this was real funny and effective storytelling because we have this thing that I like from Impact they're they're like mic'd up the wrestlers are mic'd up so you hear the trash talking and stuff this here, we hear the conversation between Pac and Bryce Remsburg. But mostly, it's just Bryce Remsburg just laying down the law. And then we get the fucking DDT spot while Pac is being uh, distracted. Orange goes for like the DDT spot that Pac sells really well. He goes for one outside the ring. He goes for one inside the ring. Pin and then kick out. Near fall. And shit, we get a spot that I think causes the bleeding of Pac's ear because his ear bleeds for some reason and it's probably this one right here because Orange goes for a diving attack, Pac catches him in a pile driver position, Orange then flips it back the other way, goes for an air raid crash, and then Pac just starts bleeding from the ear. This, this is not very good for like someone's hearing. I'm hoping it's just a flesh wound, but if it's coming from inside, it's, it's bad. It could be like a ruptured eardrum or something. And then as we go to the finish, the story revolves around the hammer. Pac goes for the hammer again, but then fucking Danhausen is right there. He holds on to it. He delays. Pac then kicks his ass. Goodbye, Danhausen. 
And then Bryce Remsburg takes away the hammer. And then apparently, Pac has another one planted under the ring. He takes that and he brings it inside, hoping to hit Orange. But Swerve, Orange just manages to do a punch. It's not like an Orange punch. It's, it's just like a pretty stiff punch. And then Orange picks up the hammer. Uh, the dude is pissed. He breaks character. He's no longer this cool, composed dude, but he's raging because this fucking bastard here tried to take out your friend. He tried to take you out. So Orange telegraphs that he's going to hit Pac with a hammer. This almost costs him the match. He doesn't. He drops it, but like Pac goes for the roll-up, kick out, and then we get the Orange Punch. And then we get a second Orange Punch for the win. Fucking great match. Pay-per-view. Undercard only because of the length. <laughs> yeah, this is... This was really good, and there are a lot of honorable mention spots, but the top three are. So number three is when Pac drags Orange's corpse to the ramp and then tombstones him on the fucking ramp. This was really impactful. I think this was the most devastating move done, but since it's outside the ring, Orange manages to survive. Number two spot is when... Orange takes the hammer, he contemplates hitting Pac, but then he chooses not to. This was the climax of the story of the match, and it was very fucking effective. Again, if you think AEW doesn't do storytelling, suck, suck a dick. Suck Jim Cornette's dick, go fuck his wife, because he probably will allow you to do so. And then the number one spot of the match is the DDT, or the DDTs that... Pack sells just so good. It never fucking gets old. It's the same motion every time. And now I think Pack is Orange Cassidy's perfect fucking opponent because of this. And also, Orange is Pack's perfect opponent. Because no one else sells Orange's moves better. There's this like complement of styles that's happening. And then, like, there's this contrast where Pac is super serious and Orange is super not serious. It just works every fucking time. Hopefully, Orange's reign will be good. Hopefully, he'll be defending it. There'll be, like, pretty funny storylines, but I hope someone, like, pushes him over the edge, just like Pac does. And next in line, I think, is Ethan Page. So we'll see what happens. Orange has one on Page, I think. But that's going to be fucking sick. And you know what? I did not feel the entire length of the match. It felt like half of its length because, like, there was not one wasted motion. There were no rest holds slash storytelling, if you ask some other people who love that shit. The fucking rest holds, the fucking wrist watches. This was fast enough, this was fun enough, and it had a lot of, like, impactful moves that like just made you forget the time every show should have one match like this and thankfully it's here in aw because god knows aw needs this shit to like save them from this crisis that they're having right now so yeah feel good moment great match and a pretty good show uh the only terrible match was the Danielson versus Jericho, that was the worst storytelling part of the entire fucking show. But then we have like two bangers that open and close the show. The women's match wasn't bad this week. And we had two segments from the biggest heel and the future biggest babyface of AEW. He was supposed to be by now, but things didn't work out because of Tony Khan's shitty booking. So yeah, MJF versus Hangman Page next year, I'm going to call it. Or it's going to be Kenny Omega. But they have to build them up to that point. MJF is fucking ready to go. But as for Page, uh, people seem to have turned on him. Kenny, I think, is a bigger babyface than Page right now. Like, We still haven't seen Kenny stand face-to-face -face with MJF. 
So who knows who people are going to cheer. It's also worrying that both of their contracts end on 2024. Hopefully they both stay. But that's for next year and for next week. I'm predicting a triple threat match between Hangman Page, John Moxley, and MJF on full gear. But we'll see what happens next week. If Mox just beats Hangman like straight out, what the fuck was all of this for? I think it should be a three-way where MJF takes Moxley out and then like sends him on vacation. It could also be like a double turn, but I don't think that's going to work when your motivation is to leave the company at the end of your contract with the belt. So yeah, can't wait for what's to come. Hopefully the JSPCC storyline ends because they've ruined it already and yeah, I'm gonna watch Rampage this week. Impact Review is also coming. I'm just gonna finish this first because it's fucking dynamite. Of course I'm gonna finish this first. But yeah, like, comment, and subscribe for engagement. Share if you do not know me. Hit that bell notification for future videos and please watch my shit.